About six months ago, I just reached a point where I became overwhelmed with how poorly I felt physically. I had become convinced over this previous year about how poorly I had been treating my body and just the poor stewardship, particularly in the area of nutrition. I would gained a bunch of weight, I felt bloated all the time, I was exhausted, I was only getting about three or four hours of sleep each night. And from previous things that Jill and I had gone through, I knew that this was primarily a nutrition deficiency. Simultaneously, a friend of mine, uh, his name's Chuck, had been kind of uh, journaling his health journey on Facebook. How he had learned about um, how to eat and how to eat with nutrition in mind, not just taste in mind, and how it had changed not only his weight, but it had changed how he was sleeping, how he was feeling, his energy level, and just his general ability to navigate through life. So I'd become convicted on the one hand, I had a friend who was kind of showing me a better way on the other hand, and finally, about uh, four or five weeks ago, I contacted him and he began to send me information on his new nutritional system that he'd been doing. I signed up for it, I read everything about it, I was getting excited about it. My box of, of uh, a journal and textbook and nutritional guidelines came through the mail. I, I was poring over those things, I was reading everything that was available on the internet, both by the nutritional system and by people who had walked that path. And I got that on a Thursday and I was looking to start on a Monday and man, to say that I was excited is an understatement. I had the passion and the conviction that something had to change. I had the information that was necessary to make that change. Monday morning, I got up with my measuring, uh, uh, with my measuring cups and my new food and my journal and uh, uh, recipe, and I just stared at it. And I went to, uh, and I went to get, uh, and I didn't, I didn't touch it. And I, and I just, I was paralyzed. What I realized in that moment is that passion and conviction to a mission is necessary. Knowledge is necessary to a life change and to live out a new mission. But if we don't know or don't have someone coming along beside us to walk us through those, especially those first steps, we'll never really get started. The last few weeks, we've been talking and we've been rediscovering what it means to live on mission with Jesus. We've recognized that some Christians quit Christian mission, making disciples, because they don't rely on God's help and they don't ask God for help. And even people that ask God for help often don't get the help because they want to spend it on their own pursuits and not on the mission of making disciples. So if you're like me, God has been convicting you and impassioning you to invest your life into other people. And he has given you knowledge on how to do that. Paul says, take what you have learned from me, Timothy, and hand it on to faithful men who will, do, who will hand it on to others. You have the passion, you have the knowledge, but you wonder, where do I begin? Paul is going to take the next several chapters in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and he's going to help walk us through the getting started of Christian mission. Or what he's going to do is he's going to coach us that when Christian mission gets hard or gets bogged down, how, how do I live this out? So we want to look this morning uh, at one of the first illustrations that Paul gives to us on how to flesh out and live out Christian mission. I would invite you to take your Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 3 and 4 today. 
We're going to look, as you're turning there, we're going to look at three illustrations of how to live out Christian mission. We're going to look at the illustration of a farmer, of an athlete, and of a soldier. And we're going to investigate the farmer's diligence, the athlete's discipline, and the soldier's devotion. And that's what we're going to look at today, the devotion of a soldier. He says here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, he says, You then, my child, stand firm in the grace that is given in Christ Jesus. That's the idea of receiving help and asking help from Jesus. Verse 2, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust or commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's the idea of disciple making. I teach I take what I've learned from another who's worked in my life and then I turn around and I pass it on to another person that either needs to know about the gospel or has trusted Christ and needs to grow in their application of the gospel, including the turning around and making disciples in their own life. Well, how do we do this? So he starts off in verse 4 and he says this, or verse 3, he says, share in suffering as a good soldier, as Christ Jesus. He's going to Ill use the illustration of a soldier. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So what we want to do this morning is we want to just flesh out what it must look like to A, be a soldier, and then how that guides us in our understanding of making disciples. Now, what I want to do is I want to invite you to put on your um, sanctified imagination. Okay, I want you to dream with me a little bit this morning. If you look down in verse 7, Paul says this, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. In the illustration of the soldier that we're looking at today, next week, the illustration of the athlete, and then in two weeks from now, the illustration of the farmer, Paul is not going to give us a detailed look at every possible implication of soldiering and its application or implication to Christian mission. What he wants to do is, is he's asking you and me, think about what it must be like to be in the military, to be a soldier. Just dream about it. Asking God to guide your imagination and let that then instruct you in how to be and live out Christian mission. So if you're watching this from home this morning, this afternoon or this evening, I would encourage you to pause this for a moment and I would like for you to think about if, you're, if you've been in the military, if you know somebody who's been in the military and you've talked to them about what soldiering is like, or if you've read a book about the military, or you read a, a fictional book about a military, if you've ever watched a war movie, uh, or you've ever watched a TV drama where somebody was in a war or in the military, or if you've just sit and think and imagine what must it like to enlist and live that life. You imagine what Timothy Winden must be going through, having gone through boot camp, graduated, and is now getting additional training uh, to, uh, uh, to be a, a tank commander, to be in, um, do tankish kind of things, okay? Think about it. What would it entail? What would daily life be like? What would you have to give up to do that? I want you just to think about that and then apply that then to Christian mission. Getting started um, and just kind of think about, chew that over and meditate on that. Do that for a few minutes and then come back. Now as we think about though this, Paul gives us one implication, one application and he says this, share in suffering as a good soldier in Christ Jesus, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. 
Now, as we look at this implication, I want to focus on three words. I want to focus on the word suffering. I want to focus on the word single-mindedness. And I want to focus on this idea of pleasing the commander. So the first word is the word suffering. Paul is saying here, every person who enlists in the military chooses by default a life of suffering. Now think about this. Nobody, I, I mean, I can't imagine anybody enters the military thinking this is going to be a cakewalk. I'm just going to sign up. I'm going to get a paycheck and I'm just going to do a nine to five. I mean, they know right off the bat that they're going to boot camp. I mean, boot camp, that doesn't sound like a vacation. Okay. Then they're going to have to go and they're going to have to endure hours of specific training. And then they're going to have to potentially risk themselves in a war zone just to do their job. So choosing a military life is not choosing a life of ease and convenience. Okay. When a person chooses, when a Christian chooses intentionally to live on Christian mission, to make disciples, they are, they are by default choosing a lifestyle that's going to include suffering. Um, they're, they're going to have to give up certain pursuits in order to pursue the making of disciples. But listen, if you choose, and if I choose Christian mission to make disciples, what we're choosing is we're choosing to invest our life into people. And anytime you try to work with people, you are inviting suffering. But we don't choose Christian mission. We don't choose to make disciples. We don't choose to suffer just for suffering's sake. We are willing to endure suffering because we love people and we want to see them walk with Jesus. I would suggest to you that it is no different if you choose to be a parent. If you choose to be a parent, you are inviting a lifelong suffering in your life. Now, I'm not trying to be discouraging about the parenting process. There's a lot of joys. It is certainly a blessing. It is uh, a great and worthy pursuit, but you're gonna be rejected. You're gonna be ignored. You're gonna be mocked. You're gonna be ridiculed. I mean, parenting is just like making disciples. In fact, parenting is a disciple-making process. Okay. That's not to discourage us from Christian mission. That's not discourage us from parenting. But that's just to say that in order to live that on mission, we're going to face suffering. A godly man, a godly woman is willing to endure suffering in their pursuit to love other people, to make disciples. This is what Paul has done in his life. He's experienced rejection. He's experienced being drugged out of a city uh, half, half alive or half dead. He's endured prison. Why? For the sake of the gospel, to share Christ with others and to make disciples. And Timothy's being asked here in 2 Timothy to continue to do the same thing. If you and I are gonna live on mission, let's just get it straight, we're gonna suffer. But we're not gonna suffer as an end unto itself. God is going to aid us in our suffering to continue and remain on mission. So that's the first word, suffering. The second word is single-mindedness. Notice in verse 3 or verse 4, he says, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his objective or aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Two words there that speak to single minded devotion is the word, is the phrase not getting entangled and the idea of aiming at something. What we would say here simply is this. That in order for us to live out in real time the making of disciples, we are going to have to choose not only to endure suffering, but to become a single-minded person. We're going to choose to live an unbalanced life. Now, enter a funny comment there, that we're unbalanced. Okay. We hear a lot in life about how we're to live a balanced life. We're to eat a balanced diet. 
But when you read the scriptures, you and I are not called to live a balanced life as if every relationship were equal, that every pursuit is of equal value and importance, as if there are several missions that you and I can simultaneously choose from. God has not called us to balance. He has called us to put all of our eggs in the basket of Christian mission. Let me give you a couple of verses here. James 1, 5 through 8 talks about not being double-minded. Luke twenty two forty two, 42, Jesus asks if there's a way to escape the cross, but then submits his will to a single act. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, we looked at this last week, cannot be my disciple. These are not multitasking endeavors. What God has called us to is a single-minded devotion, both to the mission and to the master. Okay. A soldier here is said to not entangle himself or herself in civilian affairs. What does this mean? The word picture here of the Greek word for entangled is the picture of a lamb who gets his wool intertwined with a bramble bush and therefore cannot move and is paralyzed and is controlled by this bramble bush. Or imagine if you like Westerns, okay? Uh, two guys meet on a dusty avenue at high noon and they're, they're gonna have a gunfight. They're gonna have a duel. And right before the guys pull out their six shooters, they take their coat and they throw their coat behind them, right? Giving complete and unrestricted access uh, to the handle of their gun. In other words, they don't want anything interfering with their mobility to draw. Or, if you're a sheep, you want to steer clear of anything that's going that you could get your wool entangled with and therefore keep you under its control. Now, when he says here, that a soldier, that a Christian on mission does not get entangled with civilian affairs, what he's saying is that we don't get so involved with civilian issues and conversation and argumentation that it paralyzes us from our mission. Now notice here, he does not say don't get involved in civilian affairs. He says, don't get entangled in them. What does that mean? In order for us to live on mission, we're going to have to get involved in our community. We're going to have to get involved in the issues of our society. We're going to have to get down into the dirt and the grime with the people that need Jesus. Okay? We're going to have to get involved, but we don't get entangled. The civilian affairs mentioned here are not inherently sinful activities, but it's the idea that we get so absorbed in the issue or the conflict or the concept that we forget the mission and we shift our focus from Christ's mission to a personal mission. Now, the illustration of a soldier does break down here. When a soldier enlists in the military, he leaves his family, he leaves his job, he leaves his title, he leaves his pursuits. When a Christian takes up Christian mission, he doesn't leave his marriage, he, she doesn't leave her family, she doesn't necessarily change jobs or leave the community, but rather now looks at her family, looks at his marriage, looks at his job, sees his community, and begins to engage it for Jesus on mission, begins to see it as an opportunity to make disciples and no, no longer than just as an end unto itself. One commentator says this, if we become entangled, if we become entangled instead of seeing these areas of life as opportunities 
we soon lose the state of constant preparation and alertness which is indispensable which is an indispensable condition for success in the mission paul sees this we know paul is a tent maker <clears throat> paul lives on mission but in the morning he gets every, up every day and he sews and makes tents but he doesn't make tents just as an end unto itself he now sees tent making as an opportunity to fund and to continue in the area of making disciples. So let me ask you a couple of areas for you to consider. How about politics? Politics in Christian missions now becomes an opportunity for representing righteousness in the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of both the federal and local government. Politics can be a pursuit to stand up for justice and mercy and make disciples among both the influential in our community and the constituents in which you might rep be representing. Or, politics can become a flashpoint for argumentation, division with other believers and unbelievers alike, it can become an arena for me to exercise power and control or to gain possessions or privilege or to gain pay Facebook likes. You see the difference? <clears throat> Politics is not a good or bad thing. It depends upon how we leverage our thoughts and our involvement in the process. Are we leveraging it for a personal mission or are we leveraging it for Christian mission and making disciple and doing what's, what's right and doing justly and mercifully? A Christian can be involved in politics and remain on mission to make disciples. Or a Christian can get in politics and make it all about self. How about business? Business can be a platform for bettering people in an earthly manner as well as an eternal man. We can use business, business practices, and businesses themselves to contribute to human flourishing. We can make connections for the gospel through business. We can teach business principles to help lift people out of poverty. Or we can use our business or business models to slide through the back doors of closed countries for missionary work. Or we can use business to meet and provide for our family's financial needs. Or it can become a pursuit where we build our own little kingdom of pleasure or workaholism or control or perfection. There's nothing innately wrong with business or commerce or trade. The question is, how will we use it? A soldier has many things in their tool belt that they are called upon to use in order to fulfill the mission. Not every soldier does the same thing in the military. Okay? It takes a team effort. Not every Christian will be involved in politics. Not every Christian will be involved in trade and commerce. But some Christians will use that arena to make disciples and to live on mission. How about social service? Social service can be work where we, where we effectively feed Jesus when he's hungry, clothe him when he's naked, visit him when he's destitute. It's an opportunity for us to stand up and protect the most vulnerable, the most marginalized in our society, from the orphan to the elderly. It is an opportunity for us to live out loud both the concepts of justice and mercy. On the other hand, social service can become a pet project that boosts our own self-esteem or our own standing in the eyes of other people. How will we use it? Okay. Will we use it devoted to the mission or will we use that devoted to ourselves? Will we use that to please the commander or will we use that to please self? Listen, parenting, marriage, family is often the same. Seeing my family as a primary mission field to make disciples or to, 
to see my family as an opportunity for me to erect a monument to my craftiness or to erect a monument to my own wisdom or to erect a monument to my parenting choice or to prove a philosophy of education. You know, we can use our families to make them about us or we can use them as a platform in which to serve Jesus and live on mission. So we see that, it's, that we're not to opt out of civilian life altogether. We're not to create Christian compounds or monasteries where we're separated from the society. We're to be involved. We're to, we're to know the issues. We're to pull up a chair to the table. We're to, we're to get down into the affairs but were to shed anything that would get in the way of our fulfilling the making of disciples. I would ask you just in your own personal study to turn to Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57, where Jesus talks about discipleship and he has this interchange with three people who ask about what it means to follow him. And, the first, and Jesus says to the first guy, he says, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus isn't saying that all disciples will be homeless or penniless, but he does say this, that it is the nature of Christian mission that we are constantly on the move. He's talking here about how we need to have a flexibility and a mobility to move and to shift with the culture and with the times in order to make disciples. We're not so tied down to our things. We're not so devoted to a specific work that we forget that our primary job is to move and shift like a soldier would, willing to pick up at any moment to redirect our course in order to stay on mission. The commander has a right by the very nature of our calling to shift and move us wherever we will. We just say, yes, sir, and we move and shift. To another, to another question about discipleship, uh, Jesus says, a man says, well, let me just go and bury the dead and then I'll come back. And Jesus says, allow the dead to bury their own, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Some disciples, some people want to live on Christian mission, but they put, they put a, a disclaimer on it or they put a request on it. They say, I'll be a disciple and I'll be a disciple maker after I go to Bible college or I need to find a job first or once the kids are out of my house, or when I'm retired and I have more time, when we finally move into the bigger home and have more room to invite folks over, then, Jesus, I will make disciples. And Jesus says, listen, people who really follow me and live on mission, they don't put qualifications on when they start. They start right where they are. We don't have to wait to some special life circumstance or some space of time opening up. The call of living on Christian mission, the job of a soldier is to make time for the, his time is to live on mission. And all the other things he does, he does to contribute to it and yours and mine as well. Well, the whole point of this morning is to ask the question, how do I, how do I get started? How do I live on Christian mission? Walk me through it, Matt. And Paul begins to walk us through it by looking at the illustration of a soldier. And he asks us this, are you willing to suffer? Because you're going to need to suffer if you're going to live on mission. Just accept it. And then he says, and he asks us to consider this idea of being, being single-minded. Will you devote yourself single-mindedly to being on mission? Will you remove those things that entangle a clear draw or a flexible movement to be on mission? What hinders you? What excuses are you and I making to not make disciples? Let's clear our schedule of those things. 
let's remove those things from the table. And then lastly, he says this, he says, you know, we have an obligation, yea, a desire to, com- to please the commander. When you and I signed up to live the Christian life, we didn't sign up just for a work. We, we signed up to love a savior. And when he asks us to go, when he asks us to change, when he asks us to move, to live on mission, we do it. We don't make excuses. We don't put timetables on it. We just say where and what, and we, and we allow him to direct us. So if you're convicted that you've not been making disciples and you have a passion to do it, keep the passion. If you've been studying this the last couple of weeks, I, I believe that you probably have enough knowledge to begin the work. You say, Matt, what's next? Pour over this concept of soldiering. Look for ways that actual military service would transition to the spiritual mission of making disciples and allow God to direct your steps. Blessings to you. Commit this to the Lord. And if you have any questions, please reach out. Father, we ask your blessing on our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.